past Grandmaster's History Project in the Los Forceful Grand Lodge of Tree and Accepted Masons in Washington. My name is Bud Cook and I will be the interviewer. And our audio video operator is G. Santi Lascano. And we are honored to be here t today with Bill Miller, our Grandmaster in 1989 and 1990. Uh, first, I want to thank you for taking part in participating in this Grand Lodge History Project taking your time for us. Uh, question number one is, uh, what prompted you to, to become a Mason? Well, before I answer that, but let me uh, just congratulate you guys on this project. This is really terrific, and, and I compliment you on spending all the time that I know that it takes. To, this is going to be really valuable for the, for the future, so it's a great project. What prompted me to become a Mason? Well, it was in the family, really. Uh, during World War II, uh, I lived with my grandparents in, in Sugar Creek, Missouri for a little while. And uh, my uh, granddad was a member of Mount Washington Lodge in Independence, Missouri, which if you read the history books, that was one of Harry Truman's lodges when he was the grand lecturer at that time. So my grandfather was a, a friend of his. Uh, according to my mother, uh, grandpa was one of his poker playing buddies. Now there's no documentation to, to that, but it's a nice family story. So uh, my dad was a mason. Uh, he joined Benton City Lodge, actually, when he was working on the Hanford Project. And uh, then when we moved to Sioux City, Iowa, uh, after the war, mom joined Eastern Star, dad joined the, the uh, Abbey Becker Shrine, and, and uh, both of them were very active in that. And then I was at EMLA when I was in high school. Uh, my wife and, uh, was a rainbow girl, and so that was our, pretty much our social life when we were in high school. How did you come by the design of your Grandmaster's pen? Well, that was uh, kind of accidental. Um, I was out at Nile Shrine one time, and, and uh, uh, a fellow by the name of Al Cox was, had been potentate in 1986. And he was there, and we talked for a little while, and he, he gave me one of these uh, little uh, gadgets that uh, he had used when he was potentate. And I thought, well, that's kind of cute, and kind of a little gimmick, you know, something to uh, get people's attention. And, I thought, well, heck, fire, if they can put a fez on one, surely they can put a, a uh, uh, top hat on one, and sure enough, they could. So uh, I ordered a bunch of these with a top hat and planned to give them out at, at, uh, after the installation of Grand Lodge. In the course of uh, uh, coming up with these, well, and then uh, having done that, uh, that uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, create a little diversionary thing that uh, we put out at Cornerstones and and uh, during uh, meetings that I attended and such. And so that kind of developed a little theme for the year, something to have a little humor with and joke about. But when they were producing these uh, little weeples, uh, they, they called me and said, well, there's a tail on it. Uh, what do you want printed on there? And um, I hadn't given that a whole heck of a lot of thought. Uh, but I was at an installation one night, and we got to the part of the charge where uh, they talk about uniting the grand design. And I thought, boy, that, that just struck me. That, uh, that's really where we want to be, uniting the grand design. And so uh, it was, that's what's on the tail. And then having uh, sort of uh, fallen into this, uh, that sort of uh, decided what the pin would look like. And that's, that's where the pin came from. Interesting story. Very interesting. Uh, what was the theme for your year as Grand Master? Well, Unite the Grand Design, I suppose, to the extent there was a theme. That, uh, you know, as I say, that, that just kind of came about by accident. Uh, I didn't intend to have a theme. I didn't give it any thought. But uh, that just seemed like a, a good thing to go with. Yeah, good one. Uh, what were some of the major goals that you wanted to pursue during your term? Well, uh, you remember now that I followed Bud Gilbert, Jeff Ensworth, Mark Schuing, and Harold Tucker. Um, very popular guys, uh, in my opinion, excellent Grand Masters. Uh, I thought we were enjoying some really terrific success in the Grand Lodge of Washington. And uh, I didn't see any reason, you know, I didn't come into office with any thoughts about changing anything or uh, any uh, uh, particular things that I wanted to make happen. Um, just wanted to make sure, well, that for one thing, I didn't do any harm to the good things that were already in place and, and working. Having said that, 
There were a few things that, that did concern me and, and I thought we should pay some attention to. One of them was Alaska. Uh, the Grand Lodge of Alaska had been formed in 1982. And here we are seven years later, there's still a half a dozen lodges up there with Washington charters. And I didn't think that was right. I thought, you know, they belonged in Alaska. They, they should uh, be participating in the Grand Lodge of Alaska. And uh, I, I hope to be able to do something about that. I didn't have much impact on that. But uh, in early January of, of 1990, I got a call from David Hunt, who was the uh, worship, new Worshipful Master of Anchorage 221, which is one of the largest lodges in Alaska, certainly had been one of the most successful up to that point, but still had a Washington Charter. And he said, uh, uh, he introduced himself and, and then said, I'm just calling to make sure that I'm not going to step on any toes. Uh, he said, it's my goal this year to uh, take Anchorage 221 into the Grand Lodge of Alaska. And I just want you to know that that's my plan and, and uh, want to make sure that we're not going to have any problems with that. Well, of course, my reaction was, how can I help you? Because uh, uh, you're doing absolutely the right thing, brother. That's, uh, that's where they belong. And before the year was out, he did, in fact, uh, uh, get them uh, over. And it turned out to be great for the Grand Lodge of Alaska because they not only got a goodly number of dues-paying members, which helped them, but uh, there's been a lot of good leadership that has come out of that lodge for the Grand Lodge. So that was one thing that, that I wanted to work on. Another thing uh, that I wanted to try to do something about, uh, uh, there have been some, some things going on that, that I didn't particularly, have, well, I had some problems with. Uh, some of our more active brothers had, had been in, getting involved with Prince Hall. And... Uh, had gotten the uh, Grand Lodge, in fact. And I didn't think that was right. I thought that was kind of hypocritical, frankly, because, uh, you know, our code didn't recognize him, we didn't recognize him, and uh, I thought, you know, he, he either got to be one way or another. And uh, uh, so I said about, uh, well, what I discovered was, I really didn't know a whole lot about Prince Hall. And as I talked to people, I found out, well, they didn't really either. So the best thing to do to get to an intelligent decision is to get some facts and data. So we put a team together to gather data about Prince Hall. Uh, the most obvious choice for the chairman of that was Jim Wood, who is the uh, fraternal correspondent, was then and is now. Uh, probably knows more about Freemasonry in the state and worldwide than anybody else in the jurisdiction. So he chaired that committee. Uh, I added uh, several other people, one of whom was Don Beck, uh, Don, not only an active Freemason, but active in a leadership role in the appendant bodies. And so I wanted them, I wanted a, a connection with the appendant bodies so that they would uh, know for sure what we were doing in this very touchy area. So uh, what happened was we spent most of the year talking about uh, the Prince Hall Freemasons. And uh, by the time the Grand Lodge came around in June, uh, there was a resolution on the, on the table to uh, recognize them. That passed uh, with, a, with a great majority. It was not unanimous, but uh, with a great majority. Uh, we wound up being the third jurisdiction in the current era. Of course, we were the first in, in, uh, uh, to do that back in 1898, but, but got into some trouble with that. But eventually, uh, we did the right thing, and that has proven to be uh, a great benefit to Freemasonry, I believe. Uh, the third thing was that there was concern about, uh, and, and a lot of conversation, about uh, having alcohol in the Masonic building. And again, I thought that was something that we ought to talk about and uh, uh, get it all discussed and get everything out on the table and, and, uh, and then make an intelligent decision about it. So at Grand Lodge, again, there was a resolution to uh, permit the use of alcohol in the building, not in the lodge room, uh, but uh, in the dining room so we could rent it for... Um, you know, wedding receptions and anniversary parties and such, and uh, maybe even uh, uh, you know for a table lodge or whatever, and uh, so that too was adopted in 1990, and uh, kind of the the, the the three things that I wanted to focus on, I guess. What were the challenges of your term? The, the challenges of the term, well. Um, it was different in those days, uh, frankly, that, you know, 23 years ago, um, 20, wow, 
coming up on 24. Anyway, um, we had 30,000 Masons in, this, in the, the jurisdiction. Um, uh, I mentioned Alaska, that was one of the challenges. We had uh, the two issues, the other two issues, of contentious issues, and, and uh, uh, so people were debating those. Um, I, had, I had come to believe that the district meeting uh, system was not working all that well. Uh, and, and I think that from time to time you need, need to make a change uh, just to interrupt thinking a little bit and, and how things are done. And so we introduced this concept of the regional meetings. Uh, I've been a, on a school board for 11 years and uh, participated in the Washington State School Directors Association and the National Association of School Boards, two of the, the best professional organizations that I've ever been associated with. And in both cases, um, their attitude was uh, you became a school board member because you were capable and competent, at least in the minds of the voters, but that didn't necessarily mean you knew how to be a school board member. And so they took it on themselves to provide learning opportunities. I thought the regional meetings could be that same kind of thing. Instead of just uh, uh, hearing some inspirational words from the Grand Master and perhaps some of the team, uh, we could have an opportunity to really make a learning experience out of it. So the Grand Secretary uh, at the time, uh, Wally Tonstad, uh, put together a, a, an excellent all-day session for Lodge Secretaries. Uh, and then we had four or five other sessions that, that folks could go to based on what their interests were. Interesting side note to that was that, that um, at each of the five meetings, uh, I introduced a topic that, uh, that was not on the agenda. Uh, and that was, I asked all of the Masons present that were 30 and under to meet privately with me. And uh, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to hear their views and, and where they were on things. Interestingly enough, they didn't tell me what I thought they would. Um, I thought that they would be um, um, well, more liberal, I guess, in their thinking. Uh, they turned out to be very uh, old school. Uh, almost to a man, and I, I was really surprised by that. What are your favorite memories as Grandmaster? Well, uh, the favorite memory, I suppose, is simply the, the uh, 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 being in the position of being the Grandmaster. It's, it is like nothing else that uh, uh, I've ever experienced before or after. Uh, you, you walk into the room as Grandmaster, and, and you feel the electricity of everybody in that room wanting you to be successful, okay? I, I just, uh, that, that it, it, every place else you go, there's a competition that goes on. And uh, as Grandmaster, that, that is not the case. Nobody is competing with you. The, the respect for that office is incredible. And, and it's palpable and you feel it. Does the man make the office, or the office make the man? Well, the office is much bigger than the man. Uh, uh, the office, in my opinion, makes the makes the man in, in this case. Uh, now, the, you know, the opposite of that is true with, with some of the accoutrements. The the um, uh, apron and collar don't make the man. The title doesn't make the man. Uh, but but the office, I think, clearly does. Uh, it is just such a huge office. It is the single most important office in all of Freemasonry. What is it like being Grand Master? Well, I think I've, uh, I've gone through some of that with, with uh, you know, what I've told you about, uh, at least my perspective, my feeling uh, for the office. Who was the greatest help to you as Grand Master? Uh, my wife. Uh, this, this uh, you know, this, 20 some years ago. So it's before the days of, of uh, Facebook and Twitter and emails, really. Uh, everything was, was paper and pencil. And, and uh, I uh, 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 wanted to communicate. Uh, and so I, I made uh, a commitment that uh, uh, every deputy got a letter from me twice a month. Uh, every past grand master and committee chairman got a letter from me uh, once a month. And uh, so I typed them and wrote them, uh, but 
and Marilyn helped me copy them. She folded them. She stuffed them. She got the envelopes addressed and stamped. And, uh, couldn't have been done without her. What role did masonry have in your life as a child and young adult? Well, like I said in the beginning, it, it uh, was in the family. And so um, you know, I had great respect uh, for it from, from the very beginning. Um, that certainly has not changed. Uh, in my experiences in DMLA, uh, uh, with the leaders in the community, um, my, uh, my, my best friend in high school became state master counselor and I worked with him in that. So we had an opportunity to, to travel around the state a little bit and, and meet Masons. Uh, so it's been uh, a huge part of my life. What important Masonic changes did you see in your career? Uh, well, I've always been impressed with, with the, the uh, uh, position of the Grand Lodge of Washington uh, with respect to the broader community of, of Freemasonry. Uh, one of the things that happens is, is a, as you progress through Freemasonry, your, your uh, contacts uh, uh, expand. Uh, you know, in the beginning, it's within the lodge, and as you go through the chairs, it's the district, and you get in the Grand Lodge, and it's the state, and, and then uh, you know, throughout the country. And so I've, I had a lot of opportunities to see what was going on elsewhere. And uh, I've always uh, had the, the opinion that uh, the Grand Lodge of Washington is out ahead of, of many Grand Lodges um, in, in the things that we're doing. I, I attribute that to a couple of our past leaders, uh, but uh, uh, whatever the reason, we, we've been willing to do things. Uh, one of the, uh, the leaders of one of the attendant bodies said to me one time that, that she was, was so discouraged that the Grand Lodge of Washington was such a, a staid and old-fashioned organization, just not willing to change about anything. And uh, that was not my impression at all. So I went home and started writing down all the changes that had taken place uh, you know, in the last 10, 15 years. And uh, I got a couple of pages of one-liners of changes that we've made. Uh, not necessarily all good, not necessarily all uh, uh, got us the, re the desired result, but the fact is this Grand Lodge is willing to make change and, uh, and be progressive. And some of them obviously have worked very well, and I think we're much better for it. Is there anything that you want to discuss that we may not have talked about? Um, well, I mentioned uh, a couple of, uh, of the past uh, of our leaders. We, we've been blessed with some really terrific people, and I'm going to go back a ways now. But uh, one, of, one of the earliest influences on my career was Bill Horn. Um, Bill uh, was an unusual guy. Um, he uh, uh, was a very people-oriented person. I, I could watch him get into a group that I knew he had never met any of these brothers before. And it was, he was just like an old shoe with them. They were buddies. And uh, he, he was able to do that. In my opinion, the reason that um, I hold him in such high regard is that, that, in my opinion, he gave us permission to think outside the box. Uh, you know, prior to that time, uh, the thinking had been that, that it's always been this way and needs to stay this way. And Bill is the one that, that I observe um, uh, enabling us to begin thinking differently. Uh, you won't go back and see a whole heck of a lot of changes that took place, but, but there had to be a beginning. There had to be somebody that opened the door. And the next one that came along was Bud Gilbert. Who showed us the way, and uh, so I, I hold those two in particularly high regard. What message would you like to send to today's Masons? Well, uh, I, I, today, <laughs> today's society uh, is kind of one it all now, and uh, I mean that kind of characterizes uh, the young people and, and such. And I think it's important to remember that it's the journey that, that is, is uh, uh, the important thing. 
because once you get there, I mean, it's like being a grandmaster. Once you're there, then you're past grandmaster, and, and you know that's prestige godmaster. It's uh, it, it, it's kind of over then. Uh, the real joy is in the trip, is in the journey. And, uh, so um, I would encourage people not to be too anxious for the final product, or the final goal. Um, enjoy the trip. In the name of our Grand Lodge and those who are involved with this project, I wish to thank you for your participation in this oral history, and I honestly mean